Okay, I think, guys, we all good to go? Yeah, thumbs up from, yeah, okay, nice one. Okay, so if we just click to the to the, to the next slide, we'll do the intros and then we'll, we'll crack on. So, hi, so I'm Mark, um, I'm managing partner of Agency Nomics. So a number of you that might be agency owners may be, already be aware of that community. It's Europe's largest free community for independent marketing agency owners. Um, and you're welcome to join if you've got three or more people in your agency. Um, and I'm also managing partner of Cactus, which is a leading marketing agency consultancy where we uh, advise owners and their leadership teams on how to efficiently scale their business. We provide expert agency advice from leading agency experts across all areas of the business. Um, my specific expertise is as a strategic advisor and fractional CFO, which is why I was welcome today to, to join the, the panel. And I consult to a number of agencies across Europe on an ongoing basis. I'm also the third author of the Amazon best-selling business book for agencies. Funnily enough, it's named Agency Nomics, um, a business book about how to grow your agency. And my passion is in helping agency owners achieve what they aspire to. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Kevin, who's going to introduce himself. Uh, thanks, Mark. Good morning, everyone. And uh, you're very welcome this morning. Uh, my name's Kevin Lord. I'm the head of global sales here at Chaser previously, and I was saying to the guys offline, uh, coming up for sort of 20, almost 25 years, unbelievable uh, career in um, either commercial lending or helping business, small businesses or, or businesses in general with the, the tools that they need to, to manage their businesses um, effectively using uh, cloud accounting or uh, visualization tools as well. So really a topic close to my heart. Uh, back in the day where I used to assess mortgage, um, commercial mortgage or commercial overdraft applications. So yes, really, really keen to get stuck in here. Uh, I know the, the other panelists pretty well as well. So um, looking forward to a lively debate uh, as well. So with that, I'll probably pass to, let's go to Kaylee. I'll pass to Kaylee to introduce herself. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, so unfortunately, very similar to Kevin, my background is also banking and lending. <laughs> but originally, corporate and commercial finance, where I was supporting farmers originally, um, and then into, into the big smoke in London, looking after big corporates um, for NatWest, and then moved into alternative finance. Um, but I've actually spent the last four years working with accountants to deliver a whole bunch of services to businesses across the UK. But most recently, head of partnerships and growth at Tellaru, where we support businesses to automate supplier and payroll payments and reduce the time, risk and hassle associated with that. Out, out to the fire, into the frying pan, Kayleigh, yeah? Like banking into accountants. <laughs> <laughs> I clearly did something awful in a past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll come back at some point. Um, and Darren, over to you, sir. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, Darren Glanville, I'm the country manager in uh, the UK and EMEA for Fathom. Fathom are passionate about uh, providing clarity and confidence to anyone behind a business. Um, I've spent the last 20 plus years, I used to have hair um, at one point. So I've, I've spent my last 20 years working with accountants and small business owners, um, uh, really passionate about leveraging digitalization tech, um, and bringing all of that together in a transformation piece that helps business owners and accountants leverage that data better for business outcomes. So that's what I'm passionate about. Great. Okay. Thanks, Darren. I would just add myself that as a, as a CFO, I get the pleasure of using each of the products on the screen. So um, if anyone's got any direct questions on the, each of the guys' offerings, and, and please just message me later. Um, we also have Amaya from Chaser on hand, and she's going to be moderating the Q&A, which we're going to have at the end of today's session. And on that point, if you have any questions, please, you know, the usual, put them in the chat. Um, we'll address them as best we can, um, as I say, towards the end of the session. Um, if we don't cover a particular question, we'll try and pick that up separately. If you have a question directed at a particular one of us, then please say, uh, like Kay Kaylee, dot, 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 put the question and I'll try and cover that later on. But we've probably got 15 to 20 minutes towards the end, but we're going to cover some some key topics first. So if we move on to the next screen, which is the key topics, um, I'm going to cover a little bit of background very briefly. I'm sure you don't want me to mention the R word, so I won't. Um, we're going to cover a few questions today that we we think are the key points, the key areas of, of debate at the moment and what we're each seeing out in the business world. And as I say, we're going to have a bit of a bit of a and a probably get it a bit more free flowing because you don't want to just listen to each one of us individually talking about our points. So we come on to the next screen, please, Amaya. Thank you. 
So, yeah, I suppose we don't need to labour this too much. We know where the world is. We know what's going on in the economy. Uh, we know what pressures we've got from a, both a personal point of view and um, a business point of view. Uh, we were talking before this about, you know, mortgages. I think, um, as I said earlier on to the chaps, I think uh, the latest news is 1.4 million people are remortgaging this year. You know we, know, we know where interest rates are at. We know a number of you are business owners and your income is coming from the business. So that puts pressure on generating, obviously, obviously profits and cash, good cash flow within your own business, which we're going to come on to in one of the questions. Um, what's been quite interesting more recently from my perspective is, you know, the, the bounce backs, the C bills, you know, I'm, I'm sure a number of you business owners that are on the call will have taken those loans and, and probably quite rightly so. Uh, they're important to, to not only keep the business going, but to, to help you hire and keep the economy going ultimately. Um, but some of those loans by a number of people have been spent, you know, they're looking for other loans they're looking for more finance and, and, you know, hot off the press. Um, I have an example of this on Monday where a client of mine looking to borrow with a quite well-known lender, um, you know, the four, five, six percent interest rates that the C bills are at are, are long gone now. Um, their quote was about 18 percent. So it kind of put it into perspective that, yes, there is finance to be to be had still out there. But it's quite worrying, you know, the cost to a small business. Um, and I probably should have said at the beginning, you know, my my area of expertise is working with small independent agency owners. So, you know, sort of half a million revenue up to about five, six million. So, you know, that is the, the crux of our economy, isn't it? A small business. So it's quite daunting at the moment for a lot of business owners. And, you know, a lot of you are also advisors. And I'm sure you're looking for, you know, what, what can I best do to advise people on their, their cash flow and financing? So we're going to come on to that a little bit. So. I suppose the other point just also is the stretch finance team, something that sometimes gets overlooked. You know, people certainly in the world I operate in um, often don't hire a finance person, bizarrely. They're trying to do it all themselves. Um, and I think now more than ever, you need that expertise in the business to help you as a business owner. So if any of you, you know, I had a, a new business call last week with a two and a half million revenue agency, didn't have a finance person at all in the business. One of the two owners was doing it all. You know, I asked the question about the cash flow and it's the usual answer. Oh, as you know, put my phone up on the screen and this is what I've got in the bank. So, you know, that's a bit worrying as a CFO and advisor. So we're going to cover that in a little bit more detail about some planning around that. We haven't got a, a cash flow tool, you know, like a, a, a flow or a futurely on the call today, but we're all well versed in that. So we'll cover that if if anyone wants to talk about cash flow planning and forecasting. But what we're going to do now, I think, is come on to the crux of today and get into the first question. So if you want to have a strong cash flow, can't you just focus on selling more? We're going to open up a poll in a minute and you'll see a poll going up on the screen. So really welcome you to, to fill in that poll and we'll, we'll cover that at the end. But I'm going to probably go to Kaylee, I think, on this one. So Kaylee, if you, can you just focus on selling more? What's your views? I mean, you could. wouldn't recommend. Um, <laughs> wouldn't recommend could. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, focusing on sales, I think it sounds like a smart place to start, right? You go, okay, well, we need more money, so we'll sell more. And it, it sounds like a logical place to start. But actually, I think the biggest risk with that is that you, if, you, if you're not careful, you really run the risk of getting into a position of overtrading, right? Where actually yeah. business isn't going to be able to deliver on commitments to employees, suppliers, or even your customers at the end of that, right? And I don't doubt that, that um, Kevin and Darren will touch on this more, but I think there's a few things that you have to think about before diving into that, right? And the first is is the planning piece. So actually, how much are you going to sell at what price to generate kind of the amount of cash that you actually want? Then you've got to go ahead and, and, and actually get the sales out, right, which in itself can be a challenge. And then the back end of that is you can sell all you want, but if the cash isn't coming in, actually, you're, you're no better off, right? You've sold a whole bunch more, but you've got no more money in the bank, right? And then once that money's in, great, you've got a you've got a nice healthy bank balance, but that's going to be pretty short lived if you can't get it back out the other way, right? So actually making sure that you're then able to pay suppliers, staff, et cetera, right? Because without those materials, without those people, you're not going to be able to deliver on that, right? And ultimately those sales aren't going to be fulfilled and it's it's kind of empty promises, right? And actually something I'm super passionate about on the back end of that is you can do all the selling you want, right? But if the, the customer service isn't there, you're not taking care of those, you're not getting the repeats, you've got clients dropping off left, right and center, you've got a bit of a leaky bucket situation, right? Where you can sell all you want, but you're constantly just topping up what you're losing, right? So I think it's a it's a real challenge. And as I say, I don't doubt that, that Darren and Kevin will have a little bit more insight on each of those bits individually. But I think 
step one is it sounds great, but just take a step back and go, okay, yes, we can sell more, but to who, at what margins, how are we going to make sure we're collecting on that? And how do we make sure we keep everyone happy in that process, right? Because otherwise you do, you get into a position of overtrading and all that does is spins into a, a pretty negative oh. Right. Anyone that's that's done bank stuff, Kevin, will, will agree with us. You see businesses come in and they're like, we're selling loads. We're doing such a great job. Lend us some money so we can fulfill all of this. And you're looking at it and you're like, oh, my God, you're maxing out your overdraft every single month. You've got no cash. How on earth are you trying to convince me you can pay this money back? Right. But in theory, it sounds great because the sales numbers are there and it looks like it's a great idea. And so it's it's a lovely idea and, and it can work it's just about taking a step back first and working out how you're going to deliver on that interesting yeah kevin actually yeah, it probably leads nicely into you and your experience yeah i agree on. with um almost everything uh, kelly said i think uh, for me if you're not um get currently getting paid for the work that you're doing then why go out and get more sales because you're still not bringing in that that revenue so i think going back to sort of kaylee's initial point is it is taking that step back and having a, a a real bird's eye view if you like or a real grasp of the data and who your customers actually are and, and what they're meant to be generating because if if you don't know who they are then how do you know if you're pricing right how do you know if you're generating the right kind of income from your current customers and then that could in turn lead to sort of disastrous processes. So, you know, in, in terms of me, it's not about it's not about selling more. It's about making sure that what you are selling currently, you're getting that money in efficiently. And then you can take the time to 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 make the proper decisions. You know, do you scale up or are actually are you doing all right just now? So actually spending the time to get in your facts right and, and knowing your business and, and knowing who your customers are is really important, getting your data right. Uh, a couple of examples, and I was thinking about this at, at the weekend with, with people that we spoke to at Chaser last week. You know, we, we had someone come in and say, you know, our, our, our DSO is really strong. It's about 30 days. Our payment terms are 30 days. But actually, when they, they uploaded their data into, into Chaser, it was more like 45 days. Um, or they were saying, you know, Joe Blogs, is, they're a really good customer. They're a really good payer. And you, and you, again, when they put the data into our software, our AI kind of read that this this was a poor payer. And when you put that back to the customer, you say, why did you think that was a good payer? And like, well, they always pay and they're very engaging. They pick up the phone to us. Yeah, fine, but they're still paying you late. So you need to be confident um, that your current customers are paying you what they should. Um, and they're paying it in a timely fashion because if not, you end up making wrong decisions. You 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 sort of uh, oversell, like like um, Kayla was saying, or um, you know you you get into a bad routine of these new people that you're bringing in as well, and that that risks customer churn uh, massively. It, it will change. Obviously, it will change across different sectors. But do you, uh, put you on the spot a bit, Kevin. Um, do you have kind of an average debt a day? That you see across or is that very much it's industry specific i suppose because i mean that by for example agencies i always say if they're doing under 40 days better days that's pretty good going to be honest given they work with big brands that will take 60 90 days often and then they've got the is there any kind of industry average that you're seeing industry yeah. averages I, 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 it certainly changes per industry. Yeah, uh, no doubt yeah. about it. So if you look at recruitment industries for example you know yeah they kind of rely on invoices being paid very quickly or if you deal with the the contractor or, or umbrella market for, for example you know those invoices more or less need to be paid instantly and and one late, late invoice could could cause real trouble there then you've got um construction for example you know construction industries might take uh 60 90 days um because they they rely on on you know other supplier terms that that kind of thing or they might buy materials in bulk so it really depends and again that's why you should really concentrate on what's good for your business um and uh, come up with that now averages are averages you know you said yourself you know for under 40 days is quite good but there could be someone in your sector that 20 days is vital so yeah absolutely with, yeah. And, yeah and so with that you you have to be individual and come up with your own payment terms there uh, as well and and be flexible on that and 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 really sorry take control of the situation rather than you know go go to the norm or or or, or follow the sheep as we say you know yeah. you are in complete control uh, of that and you should um 
be as flexible, but as uh, as also as as confident as you could be than than creating your own payment terms for these people. But not just payment terms, uh, Mark. You know, you, you also have to supply these people with a range of uh, payment options as well. So again, going back to to um, your industry, probably quite tech focused. Um, you're not going to be waiting for checks to come in for these people. Um, you know, you, you have to give them online payment options, pay by card, open banking. Some industries take cash, some, you know, postage stamps, a legal tender, that kind of thing. So you you have to be as flexible as 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 you possibly can. And that's on you as the business owner. You know, yeah, you, can, I, I, you can just absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I I see that quite often in um I'm still surprised if a new if they have like a new business called a marketing agency where they say it's a development agency, they'll often go, oh, it's it's 50% deposit up front, it's 50% on completion, and they'll invoice on those stages. And and yet you go, well, hang on a minute. Most people we work with chunk up the projects into like two weekly sprints, they invoice every two weeks. All right, it might take 30, 30 days so they get paid. But it's a, it's a, to me, it's it's not just a focus on selling more, it's the way you're invoicing, the, the way you're breaking down your, your your sale to a client, the way, you know, you're not just going, it's a, it's it's an invoice at the end of the end of the work, and that that's been a, quite a step change in our industry for over the last couple of years. But as I say, I'm still surprised how many how many agencies are still waiting to do the work and then invoicing afterwards. So you know, forgetting the point for the, for the just focusing on selling a minute, it's, it's how they break up their their invoices. D- Darren, I'll probably go to you actually because I'm not, and I'll just say um my faux pas about cash flow. I was thinking more around Darren's tool uh, um, in terms of the forecasting and the KPIs. I know a couple of people have picked me up in the chat on that. So apologies, Darren, and we'll move swiftly on. <laughs> Can I just say thank you to the Fathom advocates out there yeah, who yeah. pointed that out. So is thank is you that your mum on the line, is it? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just, yeah. just a wry smile across my face. Fancy <laughs> not having a cash flow tool on sorry, the conversation. I was That's thinking fine. about the forecasting. No, yeah. I, it's, I, 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 we, we call this a debate. I, I don't think this is a debate. I don't think I'm going to present a counterpoint to anything thing that Kelly and, and Kevin have said. I think the interesting thing for us, um, and I totally agree, Kelly started off with a really important point. I mean, you, you can't sell your way out of a crisis. Um, yes, we can sell more, but ultimately there is a fear that we will get into this stage of overtrading, and that, that's that's a negative. Um, I think businesses need to have improved cash flow visibility. If we think of, of, a, of an FD, a, a CFO, a business owner, um, you know, source data from ONS tells us that one in three has less than six months cash in reserves. Yeah, we, we're seeing late payments increase. We're seeing that increase over time. Zero small business index, as you've said, said that um, late pay- payment days are now to about 30.4 days. So we're seeing that increase. Cash is tight in businesses. People need to have cash flow visibility. So it gives them that sense of what they're aiming for. And they're always going to be cash flow. Cash in business is secular. You know, we have drains and we have gains on both sides of that. Um, so what we need to look at is what, what are we aiming for? What, what where, where are we aiming for the business to be? What are those sales we need? How does that tie into to, to when we can get that cash into the business? No one on this panel I would, would suggest is going to disapprove the fact that cash is king in any business profits and, and turnover of the vanity metrics. We know that. Um, bingo, bingo, we're re- yeah, we're bingo, re- absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, yeah. Um, five <laughs> pound in the tin. Yeah, but no mm. one's going to dispute that. I think for us is what are cash reserves? What do people have? I think, and I'll come onto this again later. I'd imagine. I think the big buzzword for people right now is runway. What? Are, what how much cash are we burning? What do we have in reserve? Kevin made a really good point, which I'm just been making some notes as we've been talking through this. Cash flow is about timing of payments. Um, Payments not be received right away, and that's that's fine. You may not have enough cash to pay your staff, to pay your suppliers. You are you're in that over trading element, um, but also no one's thinking long term at that stage. And I think we need to lift our heads. We can get bogged down in the day to day. A lot of business owners, and I had this when I was in practice, would focus on the grunt work, the day to day selling new customers, fulfilling those orders. They're not thinking about cash. They're just thinking about getting that next customer. And I think yeah, we, we have to help them lift their head, see that visibility. What outcomes do they want? They may want to look for new premises. They may want to diversify. Um, they may wish to expand their teams. How can we help them do that um, and get out of this, break this cycle of short-term vision um, and short-term cash flow pains? And I think that's the key thing for us. Okay, yeah, no, interesting. The um, 
The other bit I'd, I'd probably add to this, um, just before we go to the poll, actually, no, we just have a quick look at the poll. If you want to have a strong cash flow, can't you just focus on selling more? 74% of you know there are other factors, and we probably just, just covered a little bit of that. Interestingly, one person on this uh, call has <laughs> said, yes, selling more is the key to strong cash flow. Quite interesting. I think for me, it's um, using a tool, for example, like, like Fathom, I would have a, at least two KPIs in my dashboard on this, and they would be the current ratio and the debtor days. So you can sell as much as you want, but if the money yeah. isn't coming in, as a couple of you have, have concluded, you might have quite a strong looking current ratio, but the debtor days could be way out of control. And I think Absolutely. those two things in parallel, and if anyone needs an explanation of, of current ratio, it's current assets, bank and cash, you know, and debt, uh, debtors over current liabilities, and you split your loans into short term, long term. And so on. I know I'm playing to an audience of a lot of accountants here. They'll tell me off. They probably say not defined it properly. But those two, those two KPIs for me should be on anybody's dashboard. They're, they're so important when we're talking cash flow, notwithstanding, you know, having a detailed cash flow. And I'll, I'd always advocate having at least a three month rolling cash flow as a bare minimum, no matter how much money you've got in the business. Um, OK, we're going to come on to the next question. Um, the next question, quite a. Uh, Sensitive one, perhaps. If a finance director only has time to take care, care of one part of their cash flow, um, what should it be? Uh, probably going to go to Kevin on this one first. Um, I, I think we're, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet, but I, th I think ultimately to me, and again, I was thinking about this uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, getting cash in is the goal. You know, it, it's probably not the priority, but the goal is to get the cash in. Um, to me, I, I speak to far too many business owners, accountants, and and things like that that actually don't know enough about their business and the current state that they're in, and don't use the tools that they can do to work in what's close to real time. There's there's enough technology there. Uh, zero QuickBooks. Uh, I'm going to mention Freagent because I can see an ex colleague of mine on on the chat uh, there that I work with at Freagent. Good morning, uh, Chris. <laughs> um, but you know, having the ability to visualize all this and constantly review your position today, not the end of the month, not at year end, not six months down the line, but today. Where are you today to make the best decisions uh, for you uh, uh, as a business? And while you're doing that and you're fixing your data. Um, you know, if, if you're not doing that, you're second guessing yourself, you're perhaps making wrong decisions, you're perhaps using what you think is experience or bias or letting personalities come into the occasion. So there's plenty of tools out there to make sure that you can, if the business was to stop today, you never made another sale today, you know exactly where you are. Once you do that, you know who your customers are, you know how they pay, they know what if you know are, are they late payers or they not do i have to offer discounts uh do i have to be um sort of creative when when coming up with with invoices uh, as well i think once you do that and get a real visualization of what your data is and what your business position is today as close to real time as possible then you can build solid processes so that cash flow can't get out of control in the future um and then getting cash in it's kind of easy. You can put your efforts into the right people at the right time at the right stages. Um, so yeah, it's easy to say your priority is getting cash in. To me, that's the goal. The goal is getting cash in quickly, but without having an overview of the whole business of where it is uh, quickly and being able to make data-driven decisions on that, I think is key. Okay, and a similar, similar sort of thoughts, Kaylee, or anything a bit different? I don't disagree. I think... <laughs> One of the things that I hear really often when we're speaking to FDs and finance managers, et cetera, in businesses is that they want to be doing more of the strategic planning, right? They yes, want to be yeah. doing more of the, the thinking and the what next and all of this. But actually, like Kevin said, they're bogged down in the day to day, right? And I think it's it's a real challenge right to balance the two of of working in versus on the business right we we hear that all the time but I think from our perspective at Tellery we're obviously focused on getting funds out of the door right and actually when we look at data and research it's about 40 percent of business owners say that actually that inefficient accounts payable process is actually the main inhibitor to them paying on time and this is where you start to see how linked it all is, right? Because we're talking about getting funds in, but if the challenge of the people paying you is that their funds out process is so poor and complicated, 
everything here is linked, right? And so when we talk about getting funds out, I actually think it's one of the easiest things to implement that has such a big difference, right? Because funds in, yes, there are tools like Chaser. Yes, there is lots that you can do. But I would argue that that takes a lot more work than automating your funds out, right? That's a really easy time save. And we typically save businesses on average about 80% of the time it takes, right? Because if you are logging into your NatWest HSBC with your, your card reader and putting that in and hoping you type the code in right first time, and then you're in and you've got to find each payee and type in how much you're paying them and whatever the reference is. And then double sounds check painful, this. It sounds invoice, very right? painful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is what people are doing day in, day out, right? And so we save you 80% of the time you've taken done doing that. And now you've got two hours spare to sit back and log into Fathom and go, okay, well, what should we be doing? And to pick up the phone to the people that need to pay you and have some great conversations and negotiate that, right? And so I think... It's it's not about taking care of just one part, but I think if if I was going to be slightly selfish, I'd say your, your easiest time save <laughs> You're allowed to, be, to it's free fine. yourself yeah. up to yeah. be able to do that is funds out. Automate that, make that really smooth, free yourself up to have the the more in-depth and some of the trickier conversations from a strategic level with people that need to be paying you. You've planted uh, Olivia on this call, haven't you? Using Telerid to pay <laughs> salaries and suppliers is a huge time saver. I mean, we're very fortunate in the modern world, aren't we, that apps like yourselves and so on and software does a lot of automation now. And it's, um, yeah, it's a huge time saver. I still remember the old days of old ledger books. And I'm a bit older than some of us on this call. So, uh, 100%, right? Yeah. But I think yeah. people, people <laughs> yeah. talk about, right, like, like eat the frog first, do the hard eat bit. Eat the frog first. Exactly. Yeah. It was, and yeah. That's, that's great. But I sometimes think if you can, you can eat the nice thing and free that bit up, then, then you can put all your time. Then you can have the frog. Up, okay. Right? So, <laughs> okay. A little appetizer first. <laughs> okay. Nice one. Um, Darren, anything contradictory to the, uh, our esteemed colleagues? I no, I, I won't say contradictory. I think we've said it, we said it in the, in the last session. Cash is, is getting cash in as a priority that fuels everything else. Um, payments it fuels expansion it fuels salaries it fuels salaries and dividends wages uh insurance loan payments everything that's that's and again as i say it's secular i think the interesting yeah. thing for me is um fds cfos business owners i don't think there's a there's a difference here everyone is wearing multiple hats in businesses right now and it's you know we're thinking about sales we're looking at you know things like expenses are expensive in, in, in any crisis in any downturn in any dare, dare i say the r word people strap down everything and people start looking at expenses very very closely um i think the other thing we all acknowledge is people are time poor right now but not only are they time poor they're focusing on on, on other areas and i think you know we've got other things that are happening globally that are out there outside of people's control they're looking at energy costs they're looking at cost of living so many things are playing into this right now. The fact that there's no cheap money out there, as we said at the beginning of, right, yeah. of, 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 the, of the session. Um, what's, and again, just, just looking at this, 59% of, of business owners want their accountant and advisor to engage them with these type of services to help them through that. And I think for me, you know, where's that? People have to look at where cash is going. Why is the cash going? Do we understand why it's going out there? Can we reduce inventory? Can we get better supply terms that leads into payments? Can we get money in quicker? Can we increase stock turns? Think, think more strategically. I think that for me is is really, it, it's not a, a one and done. It's not a one and all. It's, yeah, it's, exactly. it's a more holistic approach. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to actually ask you one of the questions actually, Darren, if you don't mind. Um, Caroline's asking, which app would you recommend that can forecast forward by actual customer invoice? And takes account of debtor days to pay for each specific customer. Float. Float. Float's yep. an amazing tool for doing that. Yeah, that's what that's what I would as uh, my friend Colin runs it. I'm in Edinburgh. If, too. if you if you want to look <laughs> yeah. at the individual invoices themselves and, and the debtor days, I'd I'd absolutely recommend that. exactly. And you can do the you can do the um the entries in zero in the sales invoicing bit in terms of moving out the dates and it automatically flows through into flow and, and picks it up. So, you know, you're not changing the receivable date of the invoice, it's just changing the cash flow in the flow. So yeah. Fathom, Fathom focuses more on the longer term. That's um, what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and much more strategic. But if we're looking at direct forecasting, you, you do have float. Um, you also have zero analytics plus as well, which can give you a good, a good viewpoint for that as well. If you're a zero user, um, but yeah, have to take a look at float. I will, okay, so, 
I'm, I'm not doing my job properly if I'm not shouting out Chaser and, and our new uh, AI and, and machine learning there for, for individual debtor days as well. Uh, we just released our DSO functionality ah, okay. yesterday morning, yeah. I think. Um, so, uh, yeah. You kept that quiet. No. They kept that quiet. Yeah, where was the where was the PR of that? Come on. Uh, the, the, this event was far too much. For me. Well, there you go, guys. Oh, this yeah. is just Check a sales pitch for for yeah. Chase's DSO now. So well, that's the last half an hour I think covered. Yeah. We're going to go back to um, so um, yeah, I, I would be remiss of me not to input on this question. I think in all in all seriousness, I'd be questioning um, if my FD's only got time to do one part. I'd be questioning my FD. Uh, to be honest um but in all seriousness that is a serious point oh, but if you're at a stage where you've got an fd you know a lot of people think they've got an fd they've probably got a finance manager or a bookkeeper if you've got an fd you've probably got a finance team whether that be another person or, or multiple people as you're a bigger business and i think the key bit for the um the fd is focusing on upskilling those people in your team to take ownership of the different areas of the cash flows so then the, the the fd can take ultimate responsibility for it but upskilling yeah. your team so it doesn't just fall onto one person uh, but ultimately think, fd I, sort of takes think, ownership i've got just just interjecting on that mark i think the other thing is is we're seeing more and more firms look at this at three levels we're seeing people consider this at the organizational level and 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 down to kind of team level and then at the individual level what each what can each of those people what's the impact they can have yeah. on improving the areas within the business it's not just the organizational responsibility it could be team responsibility. How can we improve cash within, within our business and down to the individual? What can I do that layers back up to help the, the company achieve its 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 cash goals? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more with that, Darren. You know, like, are, are you, it's product, um, productivity, isn't it? Are, are, are we uh, an FD, you know, anything between what, 50, 100 grand a year? I'm, I'm probably even short saying in there you know if they're doing credit control is is that what is that the investment the company is really making in the fd to make phone calls and do mundane stuff and and it goes back to, to kelly's point as well you know you, you're getting bogged down in the day-to-day -day and and taking that step back and reviewing what you're you're asking your staff to actually do and you know, why that, and why and that is a cost to the business and we we've seen it a couple of times at, at chaser you know hey we, we we don't need your software anymore because we've just hired a credit controller well, the credit controller is just doing the mundane stuff that we were doing anyway. Like use that credit controller to 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 enhance their role. And and I'm I'm no doubt Darren and Kelly have seen it lots. You know, or we don't need the software because now we've got a human. Well, the software enhances the human to make sure that you're getting the absolute maximum uh, out of them uh, as well. I did want to raise a, another point that, that that kind of Darren spoke about about strategic and payment. Um, and like you know, creating new payment sort of terms and and things like that. And I think Kaylee mentioned it earlier about discounting as well. The, there is a there is a question here about how you track discounting and discounting invoices. And I I, I, yes. I a, a couple of weeks ago, you know, discounting doesn't need to be fifty percent off or twenty percent off. Um, you could you could offer an invoice to someone and say, hey, if you pay extra, we'll give you some marketing support or we'll do some co branded things there's other ways that you can help support to build that relationship to get that invoice paid quicker um so be creative when you're coming up with sort of payment terms as well you know hey it's not just about a 20 percent invoice but it could be well pay this and we'll give you a free training session on the solution that we do or or do this and we'll run an event or do this we'll do a blog post to all our customers to, to highlight your services that we're partners as well so it's not all about reducing the money that you're getting in but can you do something else to make sure that that payment comes quicker as well and, and not only that builds the relationship stops churning that kind of thing as well yeah absolutely yeah no interested on the the poll accounts receivable probably takes the the gold medal on this one 48 percent creating a cash flow forecast 38 percent i find that quite interesting actually because as i alluded to earlier when i meet lots of different small businesses smaller uh, marketing agencies um yeah most of them do not have a cash flow forecast <laughs> It's one of the one of the key tools we put in quite quickly into into any business, no matter what the reserves are. As I talked about before, it's really important to have because you you never know what's happening. But okay, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, the next question: What should business leaders be doing now to protect their cash flow? I'm probably going to go straight over to Darren on this one. Um, right now, I th I think that the key for every business is is runway, and and I said it earlier. Yes, I think. Yeah. People want to and need to understand how much cash they have in reserve. 
um, and also what cash they're burning through right now. Um, I said at the very beginning, one in three businesses have less than six months worth of cash. And, we've, and you know, what we've seen in the tech sector over recent months um, with, with household names that some of us will know very well, um, you know, the likes of Meta, Google, Amazon, they've, they've, they've suffered big layoffs. Um, and this isn't just a problem that's affecting Silicon Valley. It's affecting every business out there right now because um, they need to reduce cash burn. Uh, and one of the, the quickest ways of doing that, sadly, is to, is to reduce headcount. Um, so it, is, it isn't just a tech thing. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll see more of that, sadly, coming through. But I think it has to be on cash and liquidity. And I think we, you know, we spoke about a number of things. What's, what's our current ratio? What's our liquidity ratio? How quickly can we turn something into cash um, quite quickly? Um, they're looking at those ratios and they're looking hard at things like expenses, how they can get paid faster. But we need to, I think the, the one thing I've certainly spoke to a lot of advisors and, and small businesses about is introducing so, solid and sound financial stewardship. Let's look at expenses. Are, are, you know how can we control some of those there are other areas you know do a budget how many businesses haven't done a budget or they've done it once and they've filed it away in a drawer somewhere how many people have produced a forecast but they again they see that as as not a living working document that they can you know go back to on a frequent basis they just do it once and i think right now everybody needs to understand what the budget is that should be an annual process forecasting i think should be done at least quarterly and revisited yeah, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree i couldn't agree more actually darren it's interesting it? when when um when the dreaded c word happened in march 2020 <laughs> suddenly everyone was forecasting every every week you know things were changing so rapidly and then it seems to have drifted a bit since you know people aren't and i would echo exactly what you said a quarterly forecast or relook at it at least absolutely and how um, are we performing yeah. against that what's the actuals yeah. versus the forecast that we, we've achieved were we on yeah. track were we yeah. off track by how much I, you know let's we, there's a there's a there's almost a negative <laughs> feeling that comes in around this but businesses will expand through times of recession businesses will grow there are opportunities out there let's let's absolutely. be honest about that yeah. if we need capital if we need lending and funding we know that the, the interest rates are high right now. But the question for us is, can we continue to service that? Should we need it going forward and should interest rates drop? Those are the things that are going to be on the minds of FDs right now that inform those strategic long-term decisions for the health of that business. But again, yeah. not everyone's looking for funding. Not everyone's looking for exiting. Some people just want to know that they've got enough cash coming through to, to afford that family holiday next year to Disneyland. <laughs> so size is irrelevant. It's just the outcomes that we want that are really important. And I, that's that's what I think is is what should be on at the forefront of minds of business owners. And yeah, absolutely, right yeah. I think you said the words runway, didn't you? I couldn't agree more on that yeah. as well. So, um, yeah, Kaylee, what's what's your thoughts on this? How do we protect our cash flow? I think everyone needs to, I said this earlier, take a step back, right? I think what tends to happen in times like this when things get a little bit tricky and we start to we start to panic and people start doing silly things when they panic right they like, do. yeah step one is pause and like darren just said go back to why you started this business right and if you aren't the person that started this business and you are you're working for somebody that did have that conversation why did you start this business and what do you want because if you're going to get yourself in the trap of well we're going to sell more and we're going to make more money why why are we doing this? What are we trying to achieve? And I think it's a reset, right? Why do Absolutely. we do what we do? Yeah. And then let's get the team involved. Let's share the metrics that we can with the team and understand where are the challenges, right? If our challenge is we are doing a great job of selling and we are doing a great job of retaining our customers, but we are doing an awful job of getting cash in, right? If that's the situation, how do we as a team to pull together to make that happen? If we've got people on the ground that are speaking to the very same customers that aren't paying us on a daily basis, let's get those people using their relationships to leverage that. Hey, Bob, it's great working with you and I love doing this, right? But just a reminder, you do actually owe us some money, right? And I'd quite like to get paid as well so <laughs> let's, let's leverage those conversations right and share the struggles and the challenges and then I think once you've done that you're able to go okay well actually this is what we need to do and here's the plan and let's engage some forecasting software and let's get let's get those metrics there and let's start having those open conversations that say yeah we're performing or no we're not what are we going to do what are we going to try or what are we going to change and I think it's at that point that you can start really engaging with 
advisors, accountants, etc., and having successful conversations, right, around, okay, well, this is what we want to achieve. And I'm super clear on that. And then you can engage the professionals to tell you, okay, well, actually, I've worked with 100 businesses that wanted to do the same thing. And what you need to do is ABC. And they can give you that input, right? But I think there's far too many conversations where you sit back and you go, what do you actually want from this? And it's like, oh God, I've forgotten because it's been six years since I thought about why I started this business and I still haven't been on that trip to Disney, right? And I think it's hmm. it's just a pause, let's breathe, let's let's look at what we're doing and then let's plan efficiently from there and bring in the, the, the easy wins that are going to really help first of all. And then let's look at the long-term plans and, and build a path yeah. so we know I think it's a very, I think it's a very, very good point you raise about um, reassessing why you went into business for the business owners on this call because that... I, I see it quite often that the almost one of the first things to get cut is the owner's takings because quite understandably people want to protect their team, keep the team on board and so on. And then you see a few months down the road and the business owner hasn't really paid themselves. And they're then, in a, I always call it the pot noodle scenario. You know, they're ending up living off pot noodles because they can't. And, um, you know, you think, well, they're then in a bad place. They're then not motivated. They're not going out doing new business, you know, not talking at events, et cetera. That tends to happen. And it, stem, it stems to not... Yeah. Accountants and advisors, right? I think let's let's remember why you're there, right? Yes, yeah. there is a, a compliance element, but actually, if you look at your client list, can you confidently tell me what each of them do and why they do it? Because that I think is also important. It's all well and good that you provide the best service in the world and you've got all the fancy tools. And Absolutely, but you might not understand. Do yeah. you know your clients and why they do it? Because it's no good trying to give them solutions to problems that they're not really feeling because it looks like it might be the solution that they need, right? Yeah. So let's let's address that because it might be you're looking at it and they're not getting money in the door when they should be. And you're like, right, well, they need a tool to support them with that. Well, do they? Or is it that actually the guy that works in finance is really, really scared about having those conversations and actually probably needs a bit of a pep talk and an understanding of the impact that that's going to make on the business. Sometimes it's not at all. Sometimes it's a conversation. And I think it's easy to lose that when we're trying to, to problem solve. Yeah, absolutely. Ke Kevin, what's your thoughts? Uh, it's it's hard to disagree with that. I've, <laughs> I've just got a full house on our uh, bingo cards there. <laughs> you mentioned accountants and compliance. So that, that, that's, that's me got a full house. Um, I, I, I couldn't agree more with everyone. I think my, my first bit of advice, and kind of controversial, if if you want to call it that, I'm kind of pointing fingers, but I think business owners, advisors, like accountants, you've got to leave your ego at the door. Um, you know, yes, you know your business, you know you what why you got into it, but by reviewing constantly, um, evaluating your position, opening up, improving your communication lines, then that's where you get better. Yes, it's your business, but there are others out there that can help and support you run that business better. So I think you have to leave your ego at the door. You spoke to many people going, I know this, I know that, that, you know, things constantly change and people's situations constantly change. You might know your customer, but your customer might be going through a cash flow problem anyway. So how well do you know your customer? So it is about, you know, leaving your ego at the door, running your business, not you know, running the day-to-day -day stuff. I think Kayleigh said that there are two different skills. You know, you, you maybe got into a graphic design business because you're a brilliant graphic designer, but now you run a business and that is a completely different skill set. So you, you you have to run your business better and get a culture of constantly reviewing your positions, the tools that you use, who uses them, are they the right subscriptions? You, you might have signed up to something like Zoom during COVID and got 10 users to use Zoom, but actually you only need five now. And it might it might seem small, but fifty quid a month it all adds, adds up. up. Yeah, it all, adds, it all up. adds up. So get a constant review of your a internal processes. I am never far away from post-it notes. Um, although we all work in digital tools, sit down, write down all your processes. Who does what in the business? How can you eke a little bit more out? How can you get more efficiency out there? Um, and then once you've got your processes, then you can find the bottlenecks. Or, or the things that cost you money or the things that are useless. But my, my, my first sort of recommendation is leave your ego at the door. You know, yes, you know, you, you could be the biz best in this person in the world, but there's a huge, what I've actually found is everyone's lovely. Everyone's really helpful. Everyone's really supportive. You, you don't really find anyone that wants your business to fail. Um, so reach out to software vendors, reach out to peers, reach out to family, reach out to others that work in your industry and say, hey, how do you do this? Are you finding this a problem? And, and get 
get together. But you know, I, I don't really want to repeat. No, good, good, here, but but good, po good, good points. I mean, for me, it's quite interesting always looking at the profit and loss of a, of a marketing agency because of the world they operate in, they can't help themselves but buy lots of pieces of software that they ne then never use. So I think that um, overhead walk, as we call it, you know, having a sense check is is important. But a couple of points to me before we move on to the Q and A, and we're we're going to come on to that in a moment. So please, we've got a few questions already in the in the question box, but please add any questions you want covered in a minute, and we'll cover those. But a couple of points just to finish on this one for me is talking about protecting your cash flow. We've gone at it from protecting what we've got and maintaining cash in the business, but we've got a client example of this where they've got ample ample cash you know excessive amount of cash and we were talking last week about obviously with the the recent use of credit suisse etc what do we do about that you know it's not you know you never know what's going to happen that's been proved recently with some big businesses so we were talking about spreading that cash across the different banks and all, and actually for once you know we haven't been able to do this for a number of years but taking advantage of decent interest rates in terms of the, making some money on our savings so I think when you're talking about protecting your cash flow, there is that bit of, is your cash all in one place? Is that actually at risk? Because one of the big guys has just been proved could go down. So, you know, got to be careful there. And the other bit for me is, <laughs> is the facilities piece, protecting your cash flow. You know, cash isn't just the cash in the bank and the cash that's in debtors that's got to come in. You know, I'd always advocate, you know, looking at getting a, an overdraft into a business and you can usually get up to about 25 grand uh, without a personal guarantee, which a lot of people are, you know, understand would be averse to doing a personal guarantee. So, you know, protecting your cash flow is about creating buffers and facilities in place, not just not just having money in the bank, you know, refining your, your expenditure and, and trying to get the debtors in quicker. It's, it's creating what I would say is, as we refer to, facilities. And part of that, and just to finish on, is, is a still... Say, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. First, uh actual debate topic here just to yeah. just throw something in uh, let's go on. for it let's go to the debate <laughs> is, um, <laughs> let's move on Come you on. mentioned overdrafts yeah. and personal guarantees and the one thing i would say is business <laughs> have a tendency to take finance which is whatever they can get access to that feels like it's the easiest route because for a lot of people it's confusing they don't really understand it personal guarantees sound really scary right and the oh, one thing yeah, I would yeah. say is please don't do any of those things without consulting advisors and actually exploring mm. what's available rates Absolutely. at the moment are scary compared to yeah. what they were a few years yeah. ago please take an opportunity and step back and from a personal guarantee mm. perspective a personal guarantee in theory is you saying I believe in my business and I support this decision and I am going in with you Mr bank manager to say that I'm going to pay these funds back right and so I think Again, don't sign up to anything without without looking at it fully. But I think just take a take a step back again, go and assess what the options are and make educated decisions from there. I think it sounds great to have an overdraft to have that buffer. But actually, if your issue is around your cash flow cycle and what that looks like, it might be you don't need an overdraft, you need a, 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 a invoice financing, in what's finance yeah. solution in, right? So I think, yeah, just if we're if we're talking finance options. This probably isn't the webinar for it necessarily, but there are people out there that that really support you guys with that. Yeah, well, good points, well made, um, Darren. You got your hand up. You? Yeah, yeah, I just, I, I think Katie makes a, a really, really pertinent point there. I think that leads into to something else though, which is, I think we've we've seen a lot of businesses get into the mindset of growth at all costs as well. Mm. And I think that again, because it's been there's been so much access to you know, cheap money, cheap lending. I think we're starting to see a lot of people now completely switch back on that and get back to um, solid compound growth. And that's the way forward. And I think that's that's for a lot of businesses now is really tightening up on those those areas of, of expenditure, lending, growth, and, and just being, being more managed about it than, than we've seen previously. Yeah, good point. Kevin? You... Yeah, and, and it probably goes back to even our, our all our initial points uh, here, and I, and I agree with uh, Darren there. Um, I'll, I'll go back to my own point. You know, is that ego grow, grow, grow? I need to be seen to grow. I need, I need a second shop. I need a second location, a third office. I need to go worldwide uh, at all costs. Uh, is that uh, advisable? Um, to me, it's it's all communication. You know, it's all about communication, and, and I don't mean yeah. verbal communication. It's data. It's it's it's, it's um, you know, are we doing the right thing are we speaking to the right people in the right way and, and and doing the right thing and i think you could go back to most pain points in in the world um you know probably down to poor communication or, or not being sort of 
upfront and honest about it. And I was going to agree with a final point that Kayleigh said, and I've completely uh, forgotten my, my train of thought there, but uh, I'm sure it will come personal, back. Personal guarantees. Personal guarantees, overdrafts, facilities. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, yeah, I suppose, it, 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 again, back to my, uh, my career, I was very similar to, to Kayleigh. People just took overdrafts because they were available, or that was just a dumb thing to do, or it was just what's always been done. There's so many options out there, but I'll probably go back to you know the, the ego and communication thing. Like, be open, be honest, seek help, speak to people. You're not alone. Um, but but ultimately, you know, it's not growth at all costs. It's about securing your business and securing your family's way 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 of life. Um, really. Um, but but to me, it's all about you know getting getting used to what you're doing and having a real grasp of what the business actually is. Um, and and then that was the point to Kelly. Why did I get into this? Like, why did I really get into this? Um, yeah. that, that was the point I was going to finish on. But... Well remembered. <laughs> and I mean, just, I mean, just on the, the borrowing piece, as Kelly says, yeah, absolutely. You need to think deeply about whether it's right for you as the business owner and, and so on and take advice, as you say. But, you know, again, just, it's still surprising when I see businesses splurging out on IT equipment, refurbs of stuff, and they just spend the cash. You know, so you need to consider, is that the right thing to do? Should I spend 30 grand on the IT refurb or, or should I lease it? You know, we know, you know, a number of accountants on this call, they'll understand, obviously, you get the tax allowances and so on. You know, but the, 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 you know we often give the, the analogy, you know, you've probably got to get 10, for a marketing agency, you've probably got to get 10 leads coming into the business um, you've got to work really hard and spend a lot of money to get those leads. You'll probably convert probably 60% of that potentially to well-qualified leads. You probably win three maybe out of those. You then got to get, to get the work done, invoice and get paid. That's going to take a lot of money, time and effort. And you ain't going to spend it all in one splurge on a piece of IT equipment that you potentially could lease at still quite reasonably attractive rates so for that kind of stuff. And I think it's about planning, isn't it? It's about strategic planning around all this and forecasting i'm going to come on to one of the questions that's in the this is probably aimed at, aimed at you kaylee i hope you don't mind does Telleru do international payments now very easy question potentially not. <laughs> um yeah. however our head of product is on this call and i am ah. so glad someone asked that because that's just, that's just <laughs> dig at him to get that done a little bit quicker <laughs> we seeded that we but seeded it, that one in there yeah don't it's worry. coming yeah. we are we're in the process of building and finalizing things on our end uh, we've already got a list of people that that's then going to go into a pilot with our our trusted friends that if it doesn't work as they'd expect will be nice um, then they will they will test it we'll get the feedback and then that will go live so that should be a a q2 um release from us which Stephen might kill me for saying afterwards so if you never hear from me again that's why no, but, um, there's, hopefully people in, there's people in the chat there's people in the chat who need international payments now yeah that's Stephen so need, Stephen, they yeah. need international payments <laughs> that'll be next week's release okay brilliant um well it's a long question but I'm gonna I'm gonna it's probably pertinent to, to my industry actually Anonymous attendee, as our business has grown, our cash flow has got worse and worse as we struggle to keep on top of operational efficiency and timekeeping. Should we quote a higher fee for projects to allow for these inefficiencies, or do we just need to get better at being efficient with project costs and people's time? Does anyone want to input on that? Um, I, think, I think that's one for you, isn't it, Mark? It is one for me, but I was going <laughs> to ask in the panel. <laughs> Thanks for that, um, Darren. I mean... Where does it stop with the higher fees then? If you still get exactly. efficiencies and and you have to address the operational efficiencies first before you yeah uh, at, at, absolutely else. yeah absolutely because they'll just go up and up and up and and I think it goes back to all our points here about constant review. What are you demanding from your staff? L listen, it's a business. It's not a, it's not a community center. It's not a it's not a sort of we're not here. Yes, you want to get on with your work colleagues and, and things like that. But ultimately, if you're the business owner, it's your business, it's your neck on the line. So are, are you get you know, staff and efficiencies? Well, why? Do they do they are they doing what you've employed them to do? Why not? Are are you reviewing their performance? Have you got defined roles and expectations? Is there software that, that can help them do that? Is the day-to-day -day stuff getting, you know, out of hand? Are they wasting time making phone calls or tracking emails that, that something like Chaser can do? So, no, you have to get a, a grip of your own operational inefficiencies because they'll just continue if if you... See, uh, yeah, no, seeing as um, I think I think each of you have, have plugged something, so I'll plug our book. <laughs> <laughs> um, apologies. 
So, so our book agency not makes, as I said earlier on, is about the business side of running an agency. It's not going to talk to you about how to be creative or build technology and so on. It's about how to run a business and of an of an agency, and probably goes across other sectors as well, service based. But um, the the point in that book is more often than not, if we meet an agency owner, new business call, whatever, they've gone on the journey of hiring fee owners. So it's fee owners, it's the designers, it's the creatives, it's the tech people, whatever. And they don't often have the non fee owners, the, the, the non sexy people, as we call them, in the business. But actually, you see quite a radical step change when people like a project manager comes in. Um, you put in timesheet, and it's the perennial debate in agency land about whether you timesheet or not. I'm an accountant. I grew up in the accountancy for 18 years. I timesheeted my life every six minutes for 18 years. So, um, you know, I'm used to timesheeting. You see the value of it when you're, you know, you're looking, looking at all the data and then you can make informed decisions. So, Absolutely, we would advise, you know, you do bring in what on the face of it looks like non-fee earning people and ops directs or whatever at the right stages of your business. And they own and deliver on a, a timesheeting system and a project management system. And then you can, you know, input into the other tools that you might use, the forecasting and so on. But you've got to have the data to make decisions. You can't just go straight to the chase and start upping your fees because then you get into the whole debate of whether the market's going to take those fees and you're still not solving the root problem. You're just going to spend that money that's coming in and more, more earning people and still not sort the processes. So, and I'll go off on a rant on this one because it's quite a passionate topic, but I won't. So, but we haven't even got to the topic of scope creep and everything else. We haven't got to the topic. Around, around yeah. So, so yeah. that's an offline discussion, I think, but happy to, to do input to that. Okay. Any, any other questions we haven't covered, chaps? You can probably see the questions as well. Anyone want to take either of the others? Is inflation and higher interest rates impacting the time companies are taking to pay suppliers? I suppose that goes back to the debt to day terms. Uh, sorry, the topic we mentioned earlier on. Um, someone's mentioned invoice discounting. As we said earlier on, there are lots of different options around how to finance your business and you should look at each of those properly and, and get advice. But it used to be a dirty word a few years ago, didn't it? Invoice discounting and factoring and so on. But it's a well used. You know, it's, it's, you know, there's certain market leaders out there now that a lot of businesses or a number of businesses do use it. And it's, it's a good way of keeping the flow coming into the business. But don't yeah, get hooked. Yeah. Don't get hooked. <laughs> Sorry, um, Kaylee. Yeah. In terms of um, higher interest rates impacting people, et cetera, I think even pre kind of the situation we were in now, it was about 35 percent of business owners said that they used late payments as a tactic to ease pressure yeah. on cash. Right. So it's all yeah. Yeah. Um, is it getting worse? The honest answer is I haven't seen updated data to say that it is, but I think 35% is a is a hefty number, even pre any any increases to that, right? So I think the one thing I would encourage people to do is I think it's really easy to uh, bury head in the sand a little bit, right? And go, okay, well, if we just pay them a little bit later and then these guys pay us and then that stacks up and on the, the fourth Wednesday, if the sun shines at the right angle, we'll be all right, right? And I think it's really easy to, to get into that mindset. And I think everyone is in the same boat at the moment, right? Everyone is concerned about this. Everyone is thinking about these things but not everyone is talking about them. So I think as, as cliche as it sounds, I think my advice would be to people to be brave and pick up the phone where you can and have these conversations. You are all business owners in the same boat, right? Be honest, say, hey, you know what? We're struggling a little bit this month and actually we are going to pay you. We have the best intentions of paying you. We value this relationship, but hey, what does it look like for you guys if we pay two days later than we were expecting to? But actually what I can do is I know we've got this money coming in. And so next month I can pay you earlier. Right. And if we do that, can we get a slight discount on that and, and negotiate, right? Have these conversations. Hopefully this isn't a position you're going to be in forever, but be honest with each other, be honest with yourselves and your teams. And I think the response that you get back from that is a million times better. Right. Because if someone just pays me late, I'm annoyed. Right. But if someone phones me up and says, Hey, this is the situation. Can we come to an agreement? I'm like, yeah, no problem. Absolutely. Right. Because I want us all to do well, because you being in a bad situation and ending up shutting your doors does nothing for me. Right. So let's let's have a conversation. And let's get there. So I think be brave, leave the ego at the door, like Kevin said, and, and have these conversations. OK, I think that's probably us on time, isn't it? Actually, we've uh, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else just to finish or. 
I can just see a comment yeah. there, and I think it's by you, Mark. Um, yes, we will be sending the, the recording out to all attendees. And, great, uh, great. Thanks, we'll, Kevin. We'll also yeah. put the um, the contact details for, for each of our um, respected comments. Great. Yeah, so everyone, thanks for that, because, yeah, just wanted to double check. But, yeah, you can see the rogues gallery there on the screen. So if anyone wants to ask us a direct question, then um, we're each happy to, you know, as Kevin says, we'll circulate uh, contact details, but, you know, you can hit us up on LinkedIn and, and fire away with your questions. Be happy to help anybody. But hopefully you've all found today useful. Hopefully you've got a few tips there. Um, and for, finally, from us, thank you so much for joining. Um, thanks for taking time out of your day. And, yeah, we look forward to welcoming you to another Chaser event at some point soon. OK, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.